one. Jim Joyce. No, no, no. Wait, I got the voice wrong. Jim Joyce. There you go. There we go. There we go. I, I, I mess I, it up. <laughs> after 11 and we're in the 11th season and uh, right. I started messing it up for whatever reason. I don't know. Yeah, I'm totally, I'm threatening to clip all the Jim Joyce's for two years, you know, <laughs> trying to just listen to you them know? And, over and over again. <laughs> you know, I think it's like, a it might actually be a torture for someone. <laughs> Like am I, am I imagine totally. listening? Jim Jones, Jim Jones, Jim Jones. All my oh, all, all the employees at Health Beacon. <laughs> Part of the initiation awesome. into Health Beacon. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, right, right. Um, the tor torture if you survive this. <laughs> so we're we're in season eleven. I don't know. Right. Are we are we projecting anything? Like, are we gonna go twenty seasons? Are we gonna go all the way to the hundred yard line? <laughs> Yeah, I think, or, I think I uh, we'll, have four, uh, four we'll leave the forecasting to the economists. Let's just see where the world brings us. All let's right. Keep, <laughs> let's keep All right. I love it. Forecasting to the economists, that's going in the notes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, no, we, we have a, an awesome guest. Uh, I, uh, let's, I guess, just dive right in, right? I, you know, let's why, why let not? him in. Let's let him let in. Him, let's, uh, let's let Mary Beckwith in. And I have a I have a soccer practice collection, so I have a little little bit of a tighter close tonight, just so we know. Okay, after, okay. After Look I'm at practicing that. soccer, but <laughs> hey, well, guys, hey. Nice to see you both. Hey, nice to going? meet you, Mary. Did, yeah, nice did you guys ever meet? Uh, I don't think so. I, I'm trying to. I mean, I, I I feel like I know you already from the uh, from this, but uh, I don't. <laughs> think excellent, excellent. Cool. Now I'm looking forward to hearing about a uh, pleasure. And where where are you right now, Mary? I'm at a I'm at an undisclosed location in North America, but uh, no, I'm I'm just on the road uh, in the U.S. So um, so yeah, doing a bit of traveling in uh, in Arizona at the moment, but um, so yeah, Fantastic. so we'll a few days. But but normally he's a Londoner. Londoner. Yeah, Londoner. no, I saw that's awesome. Yeah, no, I'm looking yeah. at business. Looks really exciting. Yeah, but yeah, um, really with our team. So yeah. Now that you know, you guys two met. Um, you know, we'll we'll dive right into the usual for our millions of followers, listeners, subscribers <laughs> that just can't wait for every week to come out. You know, why don't you take us through your <laughs> your your life journey? Actually, there's all I think only one person that that texts uh, if if an episode was missed. I, I won't call out that person. I, we were <laughs> we were quote we were quoted in newspapers and the in the uh, the digital health oh, newsletters yeah. last week, right? Yeah, it's right. Oh yeah, Bri Brian Dolan, shout out, shout out. Uh, you know, thinking what Corey said was news. So uh, <laughs> we, 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 we had, uh, we, we, we made it to exits and outcomes. However, I'm sorry, sorry, Mary, just one thing. However, one key thing to this, and I'm going to bust his chops that his journalistic um, journalism needs to improve, Brian, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's Jim Joyce and Eugene Borovich show, not just Eugene Borovich show. So just, I, you know, you know, all right. I'm just here. I'm not. I'm not looking for. I, I don't need a. <laughs> what's the word? A tag. You know. I, I'm cool. I'm cool. <laughs> anyway, right, back Mary, to so, you. Yeah. No. No. No pressure. Of that. No. I just. I just watched that episode. It was great. So. Uh, so yeah. Um. Cool. Okay. So. So where should I kick off? Should I do the the life story first, and then you guys just like, life yeah, story. Well, you rambling. And, yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right. Cool. So. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, so I guess, um, I don't know. So, so I'd say, so, you know, I've always kind of loved biology generally, you know, as a kid can remember geeking out about how plants, cells, spiders worked, uh, you know, whatever. And so um, uh, kind of naturally found myself being drawn to, um, to study biology at university and then thought, you know, kind of my life would proceed. Uh, I'd sort of maybe go down an academic path. But like a lot of folks, in fact, I think including Corey in the last episode, you know, soon realized that academia there's kind of the currency is kind of publications and it felt very divorced from like actually doing anything that had an impact on on real people. Um, so when I got the chance to join a small venture capital fund um, in between my undergrad and my master's kind of took that chance. And um, yeah, ended up spending the first six career, years of my career at this venture capital fund, which was awesome. Um, and so they were investing kind of at the intersection of life sciences and technology. Um, and so, you know, I've got to spend six years there. It, you know, VC is a really cool job. You basically get to uh, meet cool founders, learn about their businesses, get paid to invest, not your money, take credit when everything goes well. Um, so yeah, had a great time doing that, basically. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Um, 
but um, uh, kind of through that experience, got kind of more exposure to you know really the healthcare industry. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll come back to that and because some of the inspiration. But first for, of all, I, I think you you now. you know when you talked about your love as a child for what you said spiders, plants, and cells, it feels like a total post-apocalyptic horror <laughs> movie on Netflix <laughs> or something. Yeah, just the the, the the sort of stuff going on in my head. Um, I, I yeah, I, <laughs> that those are the things I ended up I ended up sort of specializing in at university, but. Um, I did get to do some awesome work with uh, um, just talking about this at dinner last night with someone, but um, uh, with uh, a research group in Oxford who specialize in kind of spider silk. And so they were looking at, you know, spider silk with these incredible material properties. And they were looking at making kind of um, uh, medical devices from it because it doesn't, you know, elicit an immune response. Um, but it's also, you know, super strong for like for, um, you know, for, for, for knee joint replacements and things. Um, and even looking at creating, you know, body armor from spider silk, which was super cool. Wow. Um, so wow. Maybe, yeah. In another life. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah, help, help definitely my fun. next start, startup is a body armor. From body spiders. armor. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get, it doesn't get much cooler than that. Yeah. Um, uh, so cool. Be, before, we, before we get, you know, a little bit further, um, you know, six years in the VC, I love how you succinctly summarize what the job is. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, I guess I'm just curious, kind of like, what did you pick up from there that actually, you know, knowing what these founders go through, these founders, all three, you know, um, uh, you know, did, were you like, wow, glutton for punishment, I want to do this, right? I mean, you, you've been kind of <laughs> living and breathing through somebody else's eyes, ears, brains. So just curious, like, what did you pick up out of that six years? Yeah, that's a, it's a great point. I think, you know, part of it was I always felt, uh, what's the right word, uh, you know, guilty, I guess, that I was, you know, just sort of as a VC kind of playing this middleman role, you know, investing money, cheering from the sidelines, as I say, you know, shamelessly taking credit for the hard work of uh, of the founders building businesses. Um, uh, but but I kind of, had, uh, you know, I, I sort of, yeah, I, I just felt like the urge to kind of um, see if I was good enough to, to sort of build something that, you know, that people wanted and, and, and go on that journey. But as you say, like very aware of how tough it was from sitting, you know, uh, you know, taking board seats at these companies, kind of helping founders through all the challenges that, you know, we were all facing now around sort of fundraising, uh, team building, commercialization, et cetera. Um, I think, yeah, being a VC, you're, you're sort of pretty lucky that you come, when you sort of move from being a VC to a founder, you, you kind of have a, a great network built in, you can kind of game fundraising to an extent, because you already have a, you know, a the inside scoop. Of, yeah, exactly. You kind of know, you know, there's still lots of unwritten rules, which I, I find kind of annoying about fundraising, um, even though there's already been tons written on the subject. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of privileged position to come from, you know, when, when sort of starting a company. Um, but yeah. Um, cool. All yeah. right, let's keep moving then. Let's keep moving and we'll interrupt <laughs> accordingly. Cool. Um, oh yeah, where was I? I was going to, yeah, so I was going to say, so how this, how this begins to sort of bleed into the, the Linda's health story is that, um, uh, you know, focusing on sort of yeah, the intersection of life sciences and, and healthcare, um, spoke to a lot of founders, particularly those developing you know, new therapeutics, new medical devices, new digital therapeutics. Um, and again and again, kept hearing like the same frustration around clinical trials. Um, how slow working with traditional providers were, was, you know, how expensive uh, things were. And for like this cohort of companies, you know, running a clinical trial, dealing with the timelines, this was sort of more stressful than fundraising, which is, you know, saying something as, as we all right. know. Um, so I was like, okay, so as an investor, you know, I want to learn everything I can about clinical trials. This is clearly like a really broken space. Who out there is, is you know, creating solutions um, and, you know, learning about kind of E-Room's law, which describes the exponential mm -hmm. increase in cost for like a flat line output in terms of, you know, the amount to, to bring in, the, the amount of cost to bring a new drug to market, to run those clinical trials has been increasing exponentially over the last kind of 30 years. Um, it just feels like there's something fundamentally very broken with how clinical trials work today. As an investor, I, I just couldn't really find the answer. Like, you know, what is it that's that's driving this, this dysfunction? Um, and the traditional explanations around like, oh, well, we've just discovered all the you know, biological targets we can hit just didn't seem satisfying because, you know, it's like saying, you know, I don't know that, yeah, uh, you know, our, our, our sort of limits of understanding of stop, which they clearly haven't. Um, so anyway, that kind of set the scene for, for yeah, then what has become Linda's health. Um, and I guess what what sort of prompted me to, to take that leap was actually when I was still in BC, um, it was sort of summer of 2020. We were, you know, peak COVID, uh, life sucked, frankly, <laughs> pretty miserable. Um, <laughs> 
but I was thinking about, you know, what, what can what can we all do to, to, you know, to help fight COVID? And the obvious thing was kind of get involved somehow in developing a vaccine. So I tried to, you know, sign up for all of the, the vaccine clinical trials as I could just as a participant. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's where kind of my my journey into into what became Linda's Health began. Um, and how many how many clinical trials did you end up on? Uh, so I've now done <laughs> four, I think, in total. But um, I just ended oh. up doing one of the because you can only do sort of one COVID vaccine yep. trial. And how many fingers do you have? <laughs> I've still got I've still got all my uh, all, all my but, um, I, I'd, I'd super recommend it. Like we've got like a list of um of of clinical trials that like anyone can volunteer for. Just you know they're looking for healthy yeah. volunteers, which I can send you guys. Um, yep. It's always eye opening, and you always you always learn something cool. Like. I won't get into it, but uh, but yeah, learned, learned a lot about my health, learned a lot about my health that I wouldn't have otherwise uh, yeah. was learned. So, so yeah. And and awesome. how did you dis- again, right? I mean, seeing and talking, right? I mean, when you talk about clinical trials, um, it's everything from the design and patient and not patient design, and you know, and and there's so many different pieces of that value chain. Um, you know, because again, right, I mean, as a startup, you need to focus. So from a problem identification perspective, you know, again, having your VC hat on at the same time from previous life, I'm just curious, cool, yeah, it's a problem. How did you sort of keep going? Just tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so no, it's a really good point, because we've, you know, we we effectively run entire clinical trials end to end, kind of like a, a, a you know we replace the role of a traditional contract research organization, which is a pretty crazy thing for a startup to do, right? Because you point out that there's a lot of sort of individual components in that. I think how we came to that realization was um, well, so first I'm just going to tell you that the story about my my COVID vaccine trial because that was sort of I think it illustrates like a lot of the issues with um uh, yeah with you know how clinical trials are run today. So yeah, I so I, I was signing up for this this COVID vaccine trial. And um, this was for, you know, the Novavax vaccine, super well funded. They were working with the major CRO um, uh, and I was trying to sign up and the website to like leave my details just didn't work. And it turned right. out they didn't have an SSL certificate, which is like basic kind of web security. Right. And so I ended up having to download Internet Explorer. Um, yeah. What is that? Internet Explorer, like what is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, this is pretty crazy. I mean, I, I just, you know, who, who doesn't know how to build a website? Um, eventually left my details. And then, you know, two weeks later, I got a call from a kind of like noisy call center who just basically like read back everything that I'd submitted and said, right. okay, sure. And so I was still kind of unclear whether I was eligible, even though or I not. looked for it. Um, and eventually two weeks after that, you know, got invited to come into a site for more of a formal kind of consenting and screening visit. Then once I was on the trial, um, you know, we were given an app by, uh, let's just say, a market leading company for electronic data capture that shall remain nameless. Um, but um, the app uh, didn't work. Um, so it was just completely non-functional. So we ended up um, we ended up being given like a piece of paper that said, you know, every time the app asks you for your flu symptoms, pretend it's asking you for your COVID symptoms. So that A, that's like super confusing. Um, and then B, you know, once once we sort of all downloaded the app, it just didn't work. So we ended up having to like email our symptoms, which were like the key part of the, you know, the key endpoint of the trial to the um, to the site staff who then sort of manually compiled them. So I was like, wow, okay, this is super messed up. Like I had no idea the reality on the ground was this bad. Um, and that was sort of the, you know, kind of the aha moment that that led to Linda's health together with them. Um, yeah, talking about, you know, these issues with my now co-founder, Michael, um, who'd spent some time in government uh, as an advisor on life sciences. And I've been speaking to folks in pharma um, at the UK regulator, the MHRA, um, you know, and their view was very much that just the way clinical trials are conducted by traditional contract research organizations is, is behind the times. Um, anyway, I'm giving you guys the really long version. Eugene, right. you asked about we got how time. we came to our, you know, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the actual, like, what is Linda's Health today? Um, so I think, you know, the issues are around sort of, a lot of outsourcing happens in in uh, in the way clinical trials are conducted. The reason the website that I tried to sign up to in the Novavax trial didn't work was because it had been outsourced to like the hospital sites where the trial was being conducted. They're not the best folks at like making things appealing to consumers, building websites. Hence, I had the experience I had. Um, so that's kind of problem number one. It's just the chains of outsourcing, which um, uh, you know, which leaves data scattered around you know around in different silos as well. Um, and then problem number two is traditional contract research organizations 
their business model is selling kind of t- people's time. time by the hour. Time, exactly. Yeah. 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 So it's an hourly rate business model, um, which is, you know, uh, not exactly conducive to, <laughs> to technological adoption or, or innovation. And so right. you've ended up, you know, they've ended up with these kind of very big organizations where to kind of scale up, they scale headcount, anything that drives kind of process improvement actually eats away at their margins. So they're sure. very kind of wedded to this, this very sort of service-led business model. Um, and so our proposed solution for that, what, what, you know, I think a lot of other folks in the, in the space have done other startups is like very sensibly have gone like, okay, let's like focus on one thing and do this and then, you know, maybe move on from there. What we've done is say like, no, that's, that's never going to work because CROs aren't incentivized to buy you. Um, uh, and really, you know, you're not going to make a difference to the actual timelines of the trial, unless you're sort of in control of the entire trial. So that's why we set out very deliberately to, to, you know, run clinical trials end to end. And to deal with the complexity well, that comes with it, we focused initially on only the simplest clinical trials, and we've now, you know, helped run over sixty successfully. And as we're, you know, um, sort of getting getting up and running there, we're kind of starting to work on more complex, so site based trials, trials for um, medicinal products as well as just medical devices, that kind of thing. So you've run, so you just started this company, you ran sixty trials. Uh, yeah. So we've, uh, yeah. So we've helped run about sixty five clinical trials to date. Um, but, uh, you know, the metric we're really focused on is the trials where we are kind of like, you know, the sole effectively CRO responsible for Got it. End-to-end conduct from design to delivery. Um, and there, you know, there are six trials where we're running kind of end to end in that way. And right. it's still pretty so impressive. The, so the, so the, the proposition in, in simple terms is what? Um, yep. So we sell, you know, a clinical trial as an outcome. Um, so if you are a, you know, we're particularly focused on helping um, sort of smaller sponsors, so biotech, uh, health tech companies, digital health, digital therapeutic companies. Um, uh, and you need, you know, a clinical trial run to show your product is safe and effective for regulatory approval to convince payers. We will help you design, recruit participants for that trial and execute that trial transformationally faster and more reliably than um, other providers. Awesome. Totally need that service. What the heck? <laughs> Great. Well, yeah, I would love to. I would totally love to that <laughs> yeah. So b- before, I mean, there's a bazillion questions that would have kind of again, right? Uh, because end to end, you know, competing with companies that yes, inefficient, very different business model, but yet again, you still need to bid it. But but let, let, let's back up a little bit, right? And I we had. Um, you know, Lena Venner uh, from First Minute, right? Brent, Brent Huberman and, and, and the founder, they're, I think, one of your investors. And I, you know, I, I, I love how they sort of built that as a fund as well, just with other entrepreneurs. I, mm-hmm. You know, I, I always curious about the, the relationship in these such an early stages. And, you know, both Jim and I also have them as well. But from another entrepreneur, you know, how you're relying on the networks and, you know, just maybe talk a little bit about, kind of your experience and I know they're not the only ones on your cap table but still just calling them out yeah um no and so Lena is on our Lena from first minutes on our board she's she's great you yeah, know okay. um it's been huge here and the whole first minute team has been incredibly helpful so so big shout out to them um uh and, and yeah I think you're you know network totally right so about two-thirds of our customers to date have come from kind of network referrals um that obviously is you know not super scalable and as I think as we're you know just we have you know more trials we can talk about more case studies that will sort of hopefully change not that you know we always plan on on uh doing really right by our customers so, so that they refer others but um so yeah that's been incredibly important and that's a mix of kind of i think it's sort of mostly referrals from our existing customers but also like our investor network we're lucky to have some great folks on board who are you know really plugged into the life sciences space like um uh a, a power on investments uh, Fabian Hansen and Christian Angemeyer, who are um, kind of big yep. on the, the European biotech scene. Uh, Alex Severonkov is the founder of Insilica Medicine um, and, 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 you know, people like that. Um, so, yeah, they've been, you know, really helpful in kind of referring other uh, other customers as well. Yeah. Awesome. When you think about this, when you think about this marketplace, because I, you know, obviously, I, you know, both of us have been in pharma before and we've now you know, started up healthcare companies that either are supporting people in clinical trials or run them ourselves. And, and you know, I always thought that, you know, it's the picks and shovels. So, you know, they're never, they're not going to adopt innovation um, super easily that drives down their margin, right? Like, so they're not going to, so, so, but, but, you know, are you, is it just kind of a, you know, a cat among the pigeon strategy, which is like, we're just going to like, you know, like, or, or are you, you know, do you have some superior, 
kind of technology lens that you're bringing to the table right from the beginning? Yeah, um, no, it's, it's a good point. So I'd say like our, you know, what allows us, so like what customers really care about is like speed and reliability. So like how quickly can you deliver, particularly yep. as a smaller company, you know, like uh, one of our customers were, um, uh, you know, helping them finish their trial in nine months versus kind of 27 months, which was kind of their next fastest quote. And so that's, um, you know, that's kind of 13 months of uh, no, 16, 17 months of runway that, that we're effectively saving them. So that's kind of, you know, that's big. Um, and then reliability, just, you know, the quality of the data, the reliability of the outcome, evidencing that we followed, you know, the, re the, the relevant regulatory standards. So that's what customers care about. But you're right, like how we actually deliver that is down to um, uh, to product and technology. Um, so on the sort of on the patient side, you know, one of the, the big ways you can help run faster clinical trials is by recruiting participants faster. That's where a lot of the delays creep in. Um, uh, and so, you know, there we have access to about 5 million electronic health records. Um, and our, we have a software tool that can scan those records, see which participants are eligible for a given clinical trial that we're running, reach out to those participants, and then kind of onboard them, you know, through the rest of our system. So that helps speed things up a lot. And I think there is also kind of just like a, a, a really like boring, but <laughs> but important point around like being able to do kind of, you know, the whole process end to end in house mm -hmm. massively cuts down on time loss due to like subcontracting with the site, which takes like six months or, you know, subcontracting with a, a vendor for this aspect of electronic data capture, which takes, you know, three months plus another three months to configure. And so because we can do all those things, you know, on our platform, it just massively speeds things up. Uh, awesome. If you add more, because wh where I was going to go, and I think, um, you know, so first of all, for full disclosure to all of our millions uh, of listeners, <laughs> um, Linda's Health is a sponsor of the DTX podcast. Um, awesome. So sh shout out. Well um, <laughs> Thanks. The, yeah. the, 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 the two are not connected. We, we've connected <laughs> way before that uh, sponsorship um, came through. So thank you. Um, we, we constantly get, you know, many listeners saying uh, great content and couldn't do it without sponsors like yourself. So that's, you know, a quick brief message. We have not uh, monetized Jim and I on this one yet. So, uh, <laughs> but I, the I reason- just, cause I haven't paid the check yet. I haven't, I haven't said the invoice yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. um, the, the reason I brought that up is in the, const of, the context of digital therapeutics, right? Um, and curious to kind of compare and contrast what you guys are seeing you know, um, because I mean, DTR companies are being held to a pretty stringent standard as they should, right? Especially going through the FDA approval. Anything that you're finding, seeing, witnessing, you know, ch differences between molecules and software as a intervention? Yeah, or at least hypotheses you like that you have? Yeah, just how, how the things are run, how the data is, like, I'm just... Just curious, like high level observations, right? Because I'm sure it's different to a certain extent, but probably yeah, in many I mean, cases it's not. Yeah, I know there's 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 tons of stuff there. Um, yeah, so firstly, like kind of agree that there's there's sort of a weird, um, you know, it feels like digital therapeutics are in sort of a, a kind of weird in between at the moment. Because you're right, you know, there's definitely a need for sort of more robust evidence, particularly for for longer term outcomes for a lot of these products. But at the same time, like we should not be regulating digital therapeutics the same way drugs are regulated, right? Because, you know, I mean, the, the, there's there's very little downside to using an app versus, for, you know, potentially quite large downside for, for taking a, a, you know, a, a drug that could be unsafe or, or cause harm. Um, uh, but just in terms of like the differences we've noticed in terms of approach, I mean, one really big one is just the attitude to, um, uh, to being able to push updates to a product, you know, either during yeah. or after a regulatory approval. Um, I think you guys have, have had guests that have talked about this before, as well as on the the unrelated uh, DTX podcast. <laughs> I know it's a big topic, um, but um, I mean, that's huge, right? Because like, you know, something that I got an appreciation for, particularly in as a VC was, you know, just the power of, of kind of the agile methodology, testing and iterating to finding a solution. Like that is how every great software product is built effectively. But that, you know, that approach just doesn't work in a traditional drug development pharma context, but it does definitely work for, you know, for digital therapeutics. And it's why they're, they're so much cheaper to develop effectively than, um, than traditional therapeutics. So, you know, I, and one of the visions for Lindus is, is really to enable founders to, you know, have a product be able to kind of test and iterate to the right solution, obviously while respecting patient safety, but, you know, in a way that's much closer to 
a founder who's building like a consumer software product or an enterprise product, rather than the very sort of lengthy 10 year, you know, cycle that you need to go through to kind of really just like test whether a, a drug product works. Um, anyway, sorry, a bit, a bit of a ramble, but, um, but basically, yeah, you know, I, I, that's I'd what we do on the show. That's what we do. We just wrap. So don't, don't, don't worry about it. You fit right in, man. <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, you know, just Mary, just uh, jumping in on that. Who did we have on from um, the Hymns Media? Was um, uh, who we had on? Uh, we had Jonah? a fellow from Hymns Media, Jonah. 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 Yeah, he's um, now with yeah. with the Pharma Forum Healthware Media. So he's he's, uh, he's awesome. moved on. Yeah. Super, super brilliant guy. But he said that the number one difference between a successful digital health technology company, or he said, or he said one of the probably largest variables on a successful digital health, you know, implementation or study um, was uh, the quality of the implementation. So the quality of the implementation. So meaning if you take a you know, if you take a pretty decent technology and it, it, there's a poor execution or implementation, you know, uh, in it, then, you know, like your experience trying to enroll in the COVID study, yeah. right? You know, so, so, so you walked away saying, oh, we have a better way to do COVID, you know, patient study enrollment, and then you make it download Internet Explorer, right? You know, so, so, and, huh. and it's maybe it's not their fault because, they had to work with the hospital systems firewall or some other weird reason that came up. But is, is there anything happening? I, I feel like that's one of the, the testing, you know, things that we're constantly trying to prove is like, no, our technology works if you implement it correctly, you know, like, and, um, or if it's done in a certain way, do people look at that or, I, I, you know, or everyone's just chasing the outcomes on the other side? Um, do you mean in terms of like the, the digital studies? Yeah. Themselves? The digital therapeutics marketplace. Yeah, no, no, completely. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of, um, you know, detailed thinking that goes into exactly, you know, if you're running an RCT, are you comparing the digital therapeutic product to like a sham app or just treatment as usual without a sham app? And then also, yeah. is it like an adjunct therapy to, you know, we're working with a company now who's developing a, a really cool digital therapeutic product for suicidal ideation that kind of works as a, a, a sort of adjunct therapy. So there's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, that, you know, there is and there should be a, a huge amount of attention paid to the, the implementation side, you know, what guidance a, a patient is given in, in, in how to use the product, which, um, yeah, I think it definitely rings true versus, you know, more traditional kind of like consumer products that aren't in the health space. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, no, for that would go. <laughs> so yeah. what do you see? So where do, where do you see your growth? Go ahead, Eugene, sorry. No, 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 go. I'm, I'm chilling. Where do you see your, where do you see your growth, Mary? Yeah, um, great question. So at the moment, you know, it feels like we're we're in sort of a yeah a really interesting place with um, you know I'd say at least half of our customers are in the kind of prescription digital therapeutic space. Um, we have some other kind of more sort of health and wellness products that are looking to substantiate health claims, um, and then starting to speak to more kind of you know traditional sort of biotech players with with you know molecular products. Um, so I think, you know, the, those former two segments will continue to grow. And, you know, by design, we focus on kind of simpler clinical trials, with, which took us to those places. But I think, you know, over the next five years, our vision is really to be that that sort of platform for for any kind of um, medicinal product. And so therefore, our growth will, will increasingly come from the, you know, I think it's initially things like, uh, you know, molecule repurposing, drug repurposing, kind of simpler trials, but then getting on to really like new molecular entities, um, you know, more complex therapies like gene therapies, um uh personalized oncology treatments and so on um so yeah i'm i'm excited obviously pretty pretty challenging you know running those running those studies they you know it comes with a, a huge amount of responsibility particularly around patient safety um yeah. but yeah would love to be able to look back in five years time and be like you know here are all these like awesome treatments that that wouldn't have existed if it weren't for us so yeah awesome you know what what you know as i'm watching you guys kind of grow and expand right um i and i love when kind of entrepreneurs, um, you know, don't shy away from being KOLs and key opinion leaders. And that means that you have to have opinions, which is great. And I just, again, you know, kudos, I think, you know, just building that, you know, I know, you know, I've seen some webinars that you guys do with, you know, Paul Wicks and Michael Pace and, you know, others, uh, and, and some of them are leaders in the industry, right? And so I think it is important, not just, I think founders, some do right not not all forget about that you have to have opinions in order to drive an industry right it's not about being on the safe side um yeah. i don't know just i'm yeah. also rambling but <laughs> yeah, no, just giving man. you kudos 
<laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, something of a, uh, you know, I'm not a clinician myself, but um, at the same time can be pretty opinionated when it comes to, to stuff around, you know, clinical trial design, particularly on the patient aspect. I think, uh, you know, being a, a patient or participant myself in a bunch of clinical trials is, as you know, yeah, I, you know, patients can often be just like an input into someone's spreadsheet, but, um, you know, if you're not treating patients well, uh, data quality is going to be poor, retention is going to be poor, and that has a huge impact on trial timelines and ultimately onto you know drug costs, treatment costs. So, um, so yeah, I, I do get tend to get pretty opinionated about you know patient stuff that affects patients. Um, on the clinical side, yeah, Paul Wicks, one of our advisors, uh, Mike Pace, obviously hugely <laughs> great guy and really knowledgeable when it comes to the um, the dark art of, of payer access. So, kind of leave you know, or, or just sort of what we'll, we'll kind of sync with those guys on on those topics but um yep. but yeah awesome awesome i mean we can keep digging in on patient recruitment this that but maybe i think um jim let's 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 get the insights with your famous question <laughs> right. let's get the insights right. we can spend more time on this one yeah so we look forward to that that, that vision you know mary so you're you know picture yourself um in a posh hotel in an undisclosed location in Arizona, and you're you're you've, you're a successful entrepreneur multiple times over, and you're writing your screenplay called Plants, Cells, and <laughs> and Spiders, <laughs> Plants, Cells, and, and spiders. spiders. There we go. Yeah, Spiders. Yeah. Where you know, and so you're writing your screenplay. You're sitting there, and a young entrepreneur that reminds you of yourself comes walking by and looks and says, "You're the guys from Linda's Health." What one piece of advice would you give that young entrepreneur starting out? Oh man! And firstly, my 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 very corporate sort of backgrounds on because my hotel is not posh, and I, <laughs> I don't want you to make fun of my hotel. But, um, this is the future. Uh, this is the future. You're alive. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's it's not the Ritz Carlton. Yeah. You mean what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not spending our investors' money in a very nice hotel. Don't worry. Don't worry, everyone. If you're listening, but um, uh, but um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a a huge question. There's there's so much stuff. Um. Part of me thinks I just like you know stand up like haggard and shout at them to run away, but no, <laughs> um, but uh, man, I think um, I I think yeah, I think like if I had to choose one thing, it would be, and, and you you know you hear about this a lot, um, but it would be just like team, particularly like kind of the first ten people who sort of join the team, um, uh, and I think you know you just the, the importance of that can't be stressed enough. I don't say this because I, you know, we've obviously kind of made mistakes as every startup has with with building a team. But I'm super excited and and just happy to be working with the team we're working with now. But I think I was I was just really shocked at like how you know yeah at how big the impact of having you know great people is. It's it's like having the cheat codes for building a company. Um, you know, hiring sort of awesome people from the start. And I think yeah, you could kind of underestimate the the positive impact they can have, but also the negative impact if you have you know the wrong people on the team at the start. So um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the the first thing. And I mean, just practically, you know, not not hiring uh, until it's really painful or until you're really sure you have the right person is obviously a a kind of good good rubric to use there. I don't know if you guys have done the same things in your businesses, um, but uh, particularly in the, the 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 fun days of 2010, 20 uh, sorry 2020, 2021, there's you know a lot of money flying around and there's kind of pressure from investors for for growth at any cost. Um, but I think, uh, you know, we've sort of reverted to it to a more sensible level. And so the temptation is, is not there as much as to, to make hires for their own sake. Um, but yeah, um, we, we've uh, talked about this, I think, um, previously, um, you know, like we have kind of a rule. Yes, yes. Yes is a yes. No is a no. Maybe is a no. And um, there were a couple of times when we went with that maybe um, and and those people are no longer with us. Right. So I I especially to your point with that kind of the initial core team, it's, it's, it's that to a certain extent gut feel of that no or maybe yeah. just needs to be a no. Otherwise it just, it, it, it ruins yeah. the team. I love that though. The cheat code, a good team is the cheat code of uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I mean, yeah, it feels that way. Cause you know, you could just, you just work with awesome people and things just happen. Things just like roll down a hill, which yeah. is, you know, the default you can take it for, you can take it for granted you can yeah, take it for exactly. granted yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, fantastic awesome well thank you for joining us uh mary and um awesome progress and uh, i'm sure i'll see you at one of these uh, upcoming events in 3d 
uh yeah that'd awesome. be awesome not not in my in my posh hotel in Arizona. Uh, but <laughs> hey, we're, we're, we're in the same boat but <laughs> nice awesome mary and, all right and, great to meet and you. to and to all the listeners and viewers hit subscribe pass it on uh with some awesome guests 